be thou my God, my guide, and hear me when I call. Let not my slippery footsteps slide and hold me lest I fall the world the flesh and Satan dwell around the paths I tread. Oh, see. Me from the snares of hell, the quickness of the dead, and if. I am tempted on to sin, and out what things are strong to the o Lord. Keep watch with him and save my soul from wrong. To the saints of God, a pleasant good day to you. Uh, and of course, today, as we know, it is. Uh, dubbed the term Carnival Monday and wherever you are today I bring this message to you uh, which is in tune and in line with the carnival festivities that are ongoing in this country and also in other countries and today I want to read to you uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and I'm going to read uh, from the first verse and on to the 12th verse Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how all of our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat of the same spiritual food and did all drink of the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let them, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the destroyer. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition, 
upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Glory to the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as son of a shall be will without end. Amen. Today, this is the reference scripture. And I'm bringing this reference scripture because I want to talk about revelry. And it's a popular question in the church concerning the place of the converted. And I'm using the word very deliberately here. The place of the converted in the carnival celebrations and in festivities of the like that we have come to know to be characteristic of carnival or the revelry as some would call it and today the scripture is speaking to us to clarify for us this question because this was also a question that plagued the early church we know that the first festivals that we would identify uh, with the early church that was uh, carnival like would have been the festivals where they would have uh, had festivities in rome and in other places unto the god of fertility and unto the goddess venus and unto the god of bacchus which is the god of wine and drink and from those things we get the terms like bacchanalia and bacchanal which is a term that we in trinidad and tobago know and love only too well we always say we love the bacchanal you love the commerce as it were and so we understand that in the early church people who were converted into the faith and the gospel of Jesus Christ in the community of believers, they would have been living and existing in communities around them that would have multiple festivities, not just once a year, most likely. And so it is always a question in the heart of the Christian, should I partake or should I not partake? And if I am partaking, to what extent do I partake, having been called and baptized into the ministry of Jesus Christ? and unto the salvation which is given of the Lord. And so these people in many places, especially the church at Corinth, of course, because we know the church at Corinth was living in a very levitious and vile society around them, uh, where there were great extremes of wealth and poverty, but also where the people were given to a sort of uh, lustful uh, type of living, if you will. And the people would have been always uh, living in a, in a sort of a, what we would call an immoral sense of, of, of living and life because of, you know, that was the culture of the society. And so in the, in, the, in the place of the church at Corinth, they were living in a place where the culture was immoral and immorality was actually culture. And if we think about our own existence and our own place, we see that in many of the of the modern uh nations that we have of the world immorality is actually a culture and it is said to be culture so we take what is immoral and what is impure and what is uh not very profitable for our existence and we say it's culture and we have a culture around it okay and i'm not bashing anybody's culture but that is what it is that is the characteristic of where we are and it's the same place where these early christians would have found themselves so the apostles uh, and the teachers of the time are writing to them so that they would not be ignorant. They want you to understand the truth. And in this way, they said that all of these people who would have been partakers of the heavenly gift, those were the, the Israelites brought out by Moses. They, they have the terminology here and we can see the imagery in our mind, baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So the apostle is making the reference and connecting the journey of the Israelites to the journey that the Christian takes where we were baptized and they did eat and drink of the same spiritual meat and obviously of the same spiritual drink. And so he is lightening the walk that happened in the early formation of the, of the, of the Jewish nation and religion to what is happening with the Christians. And he makes up a, a very potent point here that even though all of this had happened to them and they were participating either by will or maybe just by default in this process many of them god was not pleased with them he didn't say some he said but with many of them god was not well pleased so god had displeasure 
in them even though god was still attempting to deliver them and so we should not take the name and the example and the sacrifice of our lord in vain when we who have been baptized many of us would have gone to the lower ground of sorrow we would have taken a throne of grace we would have moaned and gotten our our spiritual work and our spiritual titles and our spiritual clothes and our visions we would have met saints and angels prophets, priests and kings we would have gotten manifestation we would have had the holy spirit interacting with us and doing great and mighty works for us from time to time so it was in the beginning so it is now but he's saying that do not let us take all of these things for granted because when we think we stand and we are in place and we are in a position of being uh, pleasing unto God, we actually might be falling. And this is where we find ourselves. So God was not pleased with them. But I want to talk about this particular uh, occurrence which occurred at that time and also occurring in this time, which many people have a question about why is God not pleased? So he said, this is an example unto us. In verse 7, neither be idolaters as it was with some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to drink, to eat and drink and rose up to play. So the chief displeasure, the chief sin, the chief abomination that God was not pleased with and judging these people about is identified here that they were idolaters. Now, we like to think of idolaters as people who are worshipping idols. And I want to come to this word, idolaters. But before I do that, I want to read the piece of scripture that the apostles is referring to with uh, these men and brethren. And I'm going to take that from the book of Exodus. And it's Exodus chapter 32. Now, it's good to read the whole of Exodus 32. But of course, I'm going to read the portion that is... Uh, Closer to this uh, idea that we have. And I read from the first verse uh, to the seventh verse. Or the eighth verse. And when, Mo when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Mo Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. After he had made it a molten calf and they said, These be thy gods. O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made pro proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow, and burnt offerings, and bought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink, and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go. Get thee down, for thy people which bought us, which thou boughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves, and they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and sacrificed unto it, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have bought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And so this is the story that they are referring to, where because of a lack of patience and a lack of understanding of who they were and who God was and the power and favor that they had before God, these people went forth and said unto Aaron, who was the high priest, make us a calf. And Aaron, in his fear of the people and also in his own wantedness towards sin, said unto them, well, give me all of the earrings in your wife's ears, in your son's ears, and your daughter's ears. And this is actually important because it shows us that men and women were wearing lots of jewelry and earrings at these times. And it was precious to them, but not so precious because when they wanted to heap onto themselves graven images and they wanted to separate themselves from God, they took off what was precious and adornment, which God had adorned them with because God allowed them, even as slaves in Egypt, to achieve and to master wealth. And so they left Egypt with wealth and they took the wealth that God gave them and they made unto themselves a graven image in form of a calf. 
Now, we could go into why a calf, but we'll leave that out for another lesson. But Aaron made this calf and brought it unto them, and they proclaimed it as their God. And they proclaimed it because the people needed an image to worship because they didn't have the leader there. They didn't have Moses who was the image of God unto them. So they made an image to worship because, of course, they are custom worshiping something. And the Bible says that they made burnt offerings and sacrifices before this image. Now they were making it unto God, but the image was there in place of God. And then the people sat down to eat and drink, and then they rose up to play. And this terminology is about reverie, is about having a festival, is about drinking and eating and uh, ex being, having excess of everything. And at the same time, the rose up to play part is about having uh, lust and physical desire satisfied before the image. Now, this is what would have been ongoing beforehand. So basically, they had a carnival, more or less. And the people sacrificed and had a carnival. And it reminds me now of this carnival that we have where we carnival, which means, which the word literally means, we do away with the flesh. We say farewell to the flesh. And in order to say farewell to the flesh, we indulge in flesh. Now, that is a contradiction because you cannot say farewell to the flesh if you indulge in flesh. And if everywhere you perpetually indulge in flesh in order to say farewell to the flesh, what you're actually doing is gratifying the flesh and having a perversion of mind and a perverted sense of being by gratifying the flesh and then saying you're going to fast and pray after you gratify the flesh. Christians, is this what we still do? Many of us still do this. We have a period of looseness and then we have a period of prayer and then we have a period of looseness and then we have a period of prayer and then we have a period of looseness and then we have a period of prayer and this is foolishness before god F absolute foolishness so many of us would come on a ash wednesday uh, according to the traditions of men and put ashes to remind ourselves of the sacrifice of god after we have given away to the flesh and then we fast for 40 days and then we take communion on easter sunday and we worship god on easter sunday and they worship the holy lamb of god and then we go back to our regular life living thereafter and we have this period of renewal when the gospel of jesus christ clearly points out that when we are saved, we are saved indeed. So there's no period of renewal with Jesus. When you are walking a life, walking after God, and you're living a life in the Spirit, it's a continual life with the Spirit. It's not that the Spirit will come and go from you. The Spirit of God lives with you all the time and works through you all the time when you are converted. Hence, he says, if you are converted, strengthen the brethren. And today, that is why I'm strengthening you with this gospel. So right there and then, we understand that God was not pleased with their idolatry and the association of their reverie was with idolatry. The apostles now are clarifying unto us that the reverie that they were partaking in, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, is a part of idolatry. And you will say, well, this, 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 this sounds really strange to me because I don't quite understand what this is. So if we go to the meaning of the word idolatry, that is what we want to get into. And so for us to understand why this form of festivity and the forms of festivity that occur in this festival is something that Christians should not be indulging in at all. So this particular word, idolatry, literally comes from the Greek word that is pronounced just like it, right? idolatry and this particular word is from two words one idolon and latris now uh idolon means an uh, image so it is an image that somebody sets up and the only reason you set up an image is for the image to be functional to you to worship it and then of course the second word that idolatry is made up of in the greek language is latrio now this particular word is referenced actually to somebody who is hired to accomplish a task according to the lexicon. Or what we can think about somebody who is qualified to do a job and so you hire them to do that job because they are qualified. They have the technical and physical capacity to do that job. So let's think about this. Idolatry is having the technical and physical capacity to worship and in this case to worship an image. Now the scripture says that we should serve only God and we should worship only God. So we must understand therefore that 
we have the capacity to worship God. We are the creatures that have uh, the ability to worship God. We are the creatures who can have acceptable service before God because it's about being a servant. And what we are worshiping is God and the image of God in Jesus Christ. But when we become idolaters, when we put on the things of the world, as we often do, we move the focus from being using our capacity, our gifts, our talents, our ability, our time, our resources, our 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 mental will and input, our heart, our families, our communities, our structures, our society from worshiping God, which we are qualified to worship, which we only are qualified to worship, and we start to worship now the image of the world. That puts us in a position whereby God cannot directly deal one on one with us because we have now moved the sovereignty and ownership of God in our lives, which we acknowledge that we have because we are human beings created in the image and after the likeness of the God of the universe. And now we put that focus on something else. And the apostles go on tell us that they committed fornication. They tempted God. They murmured. All of these things they did as part of their idolatry. So today I'm linking now the fact that the revelry that we have is linked to idolatry because we are setting up an image of the flesh, an image of I must commit sin. I must indulge in flesh. I cannot live without it. I can't do it out the bacchanal. When carnival come, oh God, this is my time. I must let loose because I wasn't free before. I must take away my inhibitions and I must do whatever I please and I must feel like I am, you know, I, I am. When and in fact, the gospel of Jesus Christ sets us free from day one. It tells us that we are free to choose a better way, that we are free to use our talents and our gifts for the betterment of our brothers and sisters, that we are free to live a life of peace, a life of joy, a life of, of grace, a life of goodness, a life of kindness. We are free to exercise the gifts of the, uh, the fruit of the Holy Spirit by partaking of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and manifesting those gifts within ourselves and building up those gifts within ourselves. We are actually free to spread this gospel we are free to stand in opposition to the world of flesh. And hereby Christians who are called by the name of God, who have partaken of the heavenly gift, who have received commandment from God to do specific things on behalf of the ministry of Jesus Christ, have given up that commandment, given up that call, given up that favorable position that you alone have, that God didn't give to anybody else, and given that up and given up your ability to worship God and to have acceptable service and to present your body as a living sacrifice, which is an acceptable service before God, we give that up to revel in the world. And when we go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, lovely uh, lesson, it says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for that he had suffered in the flesh, he had ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past was sufficient for us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in loviciousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the excess of dissipation or riot, speaking evil of you. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? So Peter comes now to support what Paul is saying and say, listen, you have in the past walked in that way. No problem. You did that, that's fine. It was sufficient. You spent your 20 or 30 years in the world. But when you come out of the world and when you take upon the yoke of the sovereignty of the kingdom of God and when you take upon the gospel of Jesus Christ in your life and you declare him and Lord and you confess him in your life, that is past. And the more you harbor on what was past and I used to do it and I used it and I did like it and you are drawing yourself back into a position of being in displeasure with God. And God being in displeasure with you. That is Gentile walk. And we find ourselves now as Christians, as spiritual people, as spiritual Baptists, many of us are in this problem where we are in loviciousness, loss, excess of strong drink, revelings, 
banquetings, as when we sit down and drinking parties, it used to be called abominable idolatry, rioting before God. Imagine that. And God has called you. Jesus has done it for you. I mean, you declared it for yourself and now you're going back into it. And you're asking, well, is it okay? And people now make up for themselves a whole philosophy around the meaning of the of the carnival and the meaning of the revelry and the meaning of the mass and the mass is depicting this and the 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 jamet is depicting that and the jab molasses is depicting this and it's our culture and it's a form of rebellion against the slaves rebellion against the masters and all of this lovely thing of culture it's all a philosophical and academic argument but let us look at the result of it what is the result let's be truthful let the country, let the people be truthful. Let the Christians be truthful. What is the result? Many Christians having big party and fet and stuff to raise funds. They're using fet, loviciousness, lust, abomination, idolatry, uh, the, the fornication, promoting these things in order to get money to do the Lord's work. You imagine this. <laughs> Crazy. Contradictions. Depravity of mind. Nonsense. Foolishness before God. We think about it. What is the end result? The end result is that if you check the check check it out, do some observations, increase of crime, increase of problems in marriages and relationships, thefts, rape, homicide, huh? lewdness, keeping people in their depraved nature. And in fact, after all is said and done, we don't have any proper economic benefit from it. The social benefit is that people release and people let loose and they can continue to live another day and they'll be continue to be servants of sin and being servants of sin keeps them in a particular way. Yes, lack of productivity. And when we look at it for what it is, we understand that it's not a period that's beneficial to anybody at all. And yet still we partake. Christians have no place in the unfruitful works of the flesh that is clear we have absolutely no place with the unfruitful works of the flesh let's be real let's let's just stop put a stop to it let's tell ourselves that we were wrong and we should repent we should repent and you might say well apostle uh i just went to the party and i danced a little bit and that might be fine and you conducted yourself in a decent manner but you are supporting indecency by doing it. You say, well, I need an outlet and I'm supporting the soccer artist and I'm supporting the pan and I'm supporting this and I'm supporting that. All that is fine. You're supporting, you're supporting, you're supporting. But what you're also supporting is a culture that is not in accordance with the scripture. When we look at even the manifestation of where it has gone, it has gone from being something that is uh where some people partake and you can still find glimmers of hope and light and joy in, in it but now it is something completely different and as time goes by we have seen the situation around the world gotten worse and worse and people doing more and more just as it was in the beginning <laughs> marrying and giving to marry lust and fornication orgies and parties of the like and 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 giving way to the flesh because the flesh is so important to us and we cannot do without the flesh because we are flesh. <laughs> Taking away the power of the human being, the power of the human soul from the human being and giving it away to nothingness, which cannot satisfy anybody, which cannot bring you joy, which cannot renew you day by day, which cannot support your work, which cannot cause you to focus on your goals and achieve uh, the, the purpose that God has for you in your life at all. And we say... It is what it is. So for those of you who have the question, shall I partake or shall I not partake? Is it sin or is it not sin? The apostle is saying to you today, it is sin. And sin cannot enter the kingdom of God. And we have to just take it for what it is. That is it. We cannot uh, beat up over it. We have to take it for what it is and make the corrections in our body and in our life, we have to make those corrections. There are many examples in the Bible about revelry and what happens. But in the book of Isaiah, chapter 24, verse 8 to 9, it says, and I'm reading, The gaiety of tambourine ceases. The noise of revelers stops. The gaiety of the heart ceases. 
they do not drink with wine with song strong drink is bitter to those who drink it and so when all is said and done and all the festivities cease it becomes bitterness to us again because we would not have gone forward we would not have climbed the ladder jacob so we would not have gotten any salvation any jewels on our crown and our salvation is in jeopardy because of our culture i hope this word has been a uh, benefit to you and a blessing to you if you're walking wrong correct your steps with god if you're walking right encourage other people to walk right with god and make sure that what you're doing can be backed up by the scripture and by the gospel of jesus christ the Bible is speaking to us. The apostles are speaking to us. If we want to be like them, and if we want the miracle of God to work in the way it had worked in the early church, we need to get back to what the church is supposed to be doing. I bless you in the mighty name of Jesus and pray that you are found today not wanting, but all is well with you and your God.